says, Namaste, I'm going to talk today about what I call the shackles of Hinduism. You know, today there is a trend in our world of a pivot point of Indic Renaissance, how we have started to acknowledge our Hindu identity and not feel ashamed about it. I think this is happening like after a thousand years when the colonizations began, whether it was the Islamic invasions or the British uh, colonization, um, somewhere the Hindu identity not only became diluted, corrupted and polluted, but it also became a slur. During the Islamic times, the Hindu word became a slur. It was carried on as a pejorative during the British times as well. You know, where Hindu with H-I-N-D-O-O -O still remains a word that was used in a pejorative manner. So today, I think to some extent, that whole identity where lots of people used to earlier, especially in the northern part of India, which faced a lot of these onslaughts, people were always very careful about not very, um, you know, open about their Indic identity, you know, wearing the janeus. I remember the janeu used to be a ceremony that happened pretty much before your wedding day or, you know, because it was a, a problem to wear a janeu. You know, the genociding that used to happen was counted with the janeu whether it was during the Islamic times, you know, when th thousands and thousands of Hindus were killed, the janeu was used to count the weight of, uh, you know, the number of people that had been um, killed. So as a, as a, you know, trophy. So I think there was a stigma attached to being a Hindu. There was a stigma to wearing your tilak. There was a stigma to uh, putting on your uh, Hindu identity, which today I think in many ways we are breaking those shackles of Hinduism. We have started to break them and I want to recount some of them, which are, I think still the layers of the onion are peeling and we still have work to do. So this is an unpacking of some of the layers that I feel, um, you know, are still a work in prog progress for us. I want to talk first about the de-weaponization process that happened during the Islamic invasions, where Hindus were not many times allowed to mount a horse in front of the Islamists, where, you know, they were not allowed to hold their weapons. It continued during the British times, right? It continued. In fact, the British were much more ruthless because their extraction economy was at a much um, which was a much harder hit on the Hindu and the, even the Muslim population. But the Hindu, the majority Hindu, became a major victim of the de-weaponization program. As such, um, if the Nihangs, who were the last vestige of you know, the Hindu or the Sikh, who did not give up their weapons, were hunted down and killed if they did not give up their weapons. Many of them fled down south where the kings protected them. And um, at the Kalari Payatu, our martial arts, were banned and people who tried to practice them were uh, hunted down and killed. So this was a major time of cleansing and genociding of Hindus not only through these kind of de-weaponization programs, but also through man-made famines during the British times, extraction economy, you know, Criminal Tribes Act. So we have been through so much in all these years as Hindus that that transgenerational trauma does carry on. And, you know, today we do experience the genocides. You know, the shackles that bind us are the fear of these ethnic cleansings that happen wherever Hindus lose their majority. You know, it, it, it happens with changing demographics, right? It happens due to land grabs like in Bangladesh. It happens by decimation of our population, abduction of our minor girls like in Pakistan. And in India, it happens in the form of love jihad. Love jihad is actually something that is contested so much. You know, there is a new movie coming soon on Kerala and the number of girls that have been converted and then used as um, human bombs in Afghanistan or as terrorists in Syria. But this 
uh, or sex slaves even. Love Jihad in India though is a reality. I have done documentation on this and in 2022, there were 45 girls who were seduced in Love Jihad and then killed mercilessly, lethally, brutally um, by Muslim men who claim to be their lover. So if you look at that number, um, there was another research that was conducted by another media house that said that every week one girl is seduced in love jihad. And according to my calculation, based on news media reports, every third week, every 23rd day, one of these girls is killed brutally. You know, we've seen Shadda Talwarkar's case where she's packed into a refrigerator uh, in 35 pieces. We've seen the case of a girl in a suitcase after her murder. We've seen the case of Nikita Tomar killed in broad daylight. This is gruesome form of Hinduphobia and this is the sort of shackles uh, that remain because you know there is a, um, a low-level violence that continues randomly. Uh, what we have um, you know with Dr. Omendra Ratnik coined the term rules which is random, unceasing, low-level violence that keeps those shackles on Hindus um, and their identities alive all the time because the state is not able to protect. Also then, as a second point, I want to say the shackles of conversions, the ethnocides. Now, the irony of these ethnocides is that sometimes it is the Hindus themselves who aid that process of conversion. You know, just yesterday I was talking to a girl who was telling me how she used to go around collecting donations from Hindus to send to uh, churches and uh, to the tribals where conversions used to happen. And she realized that only late, very late. I have personally as a child donated half of my pocket money in my convent school to the poor box. And though I thought that money was going to the Adivasis, right? I thought that money was going to help them. Little did I know that that money is being used to convert them. Now conversion, you know, like my parents used to say, at least the Christians uh, are doing something for the tribals. But if you look at it from the point of view of the Indic identity, as soon as these people are converted, they become, they start breaking temples, they start breaking idols, they start hating their own Hindu uh, ways of life, they start segregating and practicing some sort of an apartheid with their own family. And this is something I've seen, I was in Jabua recently, and I've seen some of these sort of um, in the Beel community, Beel community, which is considered a tribal community. I've seen, first of all, sometimes they hide their identity, but then I heard of a concept called Beelstan. Now, how does that Beelstan concept come alive? It comes alive because there is a certain coaching that goes on, you know, um, among these Adivasis when they start to get converted and they become estranged from their roots, but also they start losing their Indic identity and then the separatist movement starts. Of course, today there is a lot of work going on in the Adivasi areas to try to get these people to understand their civilizational identity. And that, again, does not gel well with the forces that try to create these Breaking India movements, right? So that is why we see movements to calling India as undemocratic, you know, it is just because Indians are discovering whether in the Northeast, whether in the Dangs, whether in Jabua, where in Madhya Pradesh or other parts of the country, they're understanding their civilizational connection to Hinduism. So those shackles of, um, you know, identity have to break, you know, where they forget who they really are because Adivasi was a term invented during the colonial times. So that colonial shackle of Adivasi is real. I will go a little bit deeper into it when I discuss what happened at the Dismantling Global Hindutva Conference. But right now I want to go into the third aspect, which I think 
is a very important aspect of what happens um, when, uh, in terms of shackling us, you know, and that is the breaking of our idols, the breaking of our temples, of our knowledge systems when our universities were destroyed. You know, when that knowledge stream is destroyed, when the murti with the pran pratishta is destroyed, when a temple, which is the ecosystem of a village, is destroyed, we definitely lose a lot and, di and dilute our Hindu and Indic identity. And that is the reason there was such a strong uh, focus, you know, even though there is a uh, gaslighting that, oh, this was being done for the money that the temples held. But of course, the process of, you know, destroying temples and tamp was a tampering of the Hindu identity. Also, if you see um, the British started to implement the idea that the state controls the temple, what happened was an immediate clamping down of the Hindu identity. All the money was extracted and taken away and used for purposes other than the Indic and Hindu, you know, identity or promotion of our personal causes or the Gurukul, the Patshalas and the Vedashalas uh, that used to run, you know, or Akharas that used to run along with these temples as an ecosystem that flourished around temples. So those are very important parts of the symbolism or the semiotics or even actually hard, uh, you know, economics of uh, temples that, that was destroyed. Um, and we still stay under that shackle of state control as far as our temples are concerned. And that is why in Kanyakumari, you will see, if you see the map of Kanyakumari, you will see between 1950 and, say, 1990, how the, you know, population changes. Population changes because the land control changes from Hindu temples to state, then to Christian churches. The land is donated out or rented out at, you know, $2 a foot or something, very low price. It is given away to, say, uh, you know, the Muslims. So immediately demographics change. And that is how the Hindu identity gets diluted more and more and more and weakens as demographics um, change, you know. So, but I want to come to further on the semiotics and the science of semiotics, which anyone who has read the Da Vinci Code will totally understand how important symbols were to any religious identity. And for us, the Swastika and the Trishul are a very important part, along with our Murtis um, and temples, as symbols of Hindu identity. And as you know, the Swastika was appropriated and misappropriated and it became a Nazi symbol and today that word swastika in the US for example they were trying to ban it as symbol uh, to be put anywhere you know so we had to fight for our right and it was a very nasty fight to fight for a right to use the swastika even today like when I am putting swastika outside my house in India. It's a normal thing during Rangolis or Raksha Bandhans, right? But if you do that in, in the US on the Shera, putting it on your car, you cannot do that, you know? So today we need to reclaim those sort of, you know, identities that are symbols because the power of Hindu uh, identity lies there. It is not just Hindu identity. If you think about it, the swastika was used by the Native Americans. It was found in Europe. It was found in Russia. It was found in Turkey even. It was found all over the world, in Buddhism, in Japan, everywhere. In, in Japan, in fact, wherever there's a temple, if you look at the map on Google Map, they have a swastika drawn there, you know? So the point is that this is an identity of what existed before the red, white, and green forces took over. I think I spoke about that earlier, you know, the red, white, and green uh, forces of communism, Islam, 
and Christianity have taken over all of the world today. The political power all over the world rests with them. The populations have been, demographics have been converted. And only in India you see a very strong presence of the civilizational identity. So that identity is used to be global. The swastika being global also means that that identity, that civilization, used to be global in some form or the other. And the Trishul, if you look, that is the other second symbol which was taken and given to Satan, Lucifer, right? Trishul was held by, I think, Neptune, by Triton, you know, in, in Greek and Roman um, uh, theology, uh, by Zeus, right? So Trishul, it was all over, again, different religions. Trishul was always existent, you know, and they took that and gave it to Satan, right? So the idea that the swastika, the Native Americans are told you cannot use swastika in your prayers anymore, you know, public prayers, may, you cannot use swastika, and they listen to it. Um, Hindus, on the other hand, have never listened to it, you know. In UK, when they tried to do that, the Hindus en masse went to uh, you know, Jewish synagogues to explain their standpoint, what swastika means to them. They went to the parliament to explain that. In US, we did the same. So in the diaspora, we have shown a lot of, um, I think, strength of character from that standpoint for many years um, and made sure that our symbols are not taken away from us. So that is why that Indic identity, I think we are hard-coded in our genetics to fight and survive, you know, from Maharana Pratap to Shivaji. And now even us in our small forms, we keep fighting and making sure that our identity is not taken away from us. Now, we come to the subtler forms of how our identity gets shackled, right? And that happens in academia and in media. I mean, we've never had control over academic discourse, you know, after our universities broke and uh, were, were destroyed. Um, we, our gurukuls, were con totally not just condemned, but they were completely done away with during the British times. So our identities were also defined by the others, right? And which is why our history always showed us as the vanquished, because, you know, as they say, as long as the hunter is writing the story, you know, the lion is never going to be the victor, right? So that in itself is something we have to conquer if we have to break the shackles. And I think it is slowly happening with alternate media. We have been able to talk about it. Today, there is a political power in India, at least, that helps to promote Indic identities, you know, that there is a renaissance in terms of temple reju rejuvenation. And those are important aspects to reclaiming our identity. Now, shackles of Hinduism are also perpetrated by theories like the Aryan Dravidian theory. As we speak of the swastika, we can never forget the word Aryan was created and appropriated um, by the racist theories and Aryan supremacy has become a standard term for white supremacy in the world. So how come swastika, Aryan, you know, and the trident or the trishul are all three taken away from us, you know, and made into some ugly symbols in this world? It is also part of the Aryan Dravidian theory. Now, if you look at the racist theories in this world, what you'll find is that there were racist theories. That was a racial time. The colonizers were always looking at things from a racial perspective because the doctrine of discovery told them that you are the whites, you are meant to conquer the world, and wherever you find people who are not Christians, you will, um, you know, you have the right to kill them or convert them. So those kind of theories have gone away. You know, theories of, of course, blood libel blood purity, scientific racism, which was used to create the whole 
caste narrative or caste censuses, those have gone away. No one talks about them. They've been banned by the UN, actually, United Nations. The science of phrenology, which, which said that, you know, you, the white, white uh, race has bigger um, heads, you know, so they have bigger brains, and hence everyone else is lower than them. So it does not deserve the same uh, treatment. So those kind of theories, the Hamitic hypothesis, they've all been done away with. Nobody even talks about them. But the Aryan Dravidian theory, which actually also comes from the same time frame, right? And it has the same sort of uh, framework of uh, is perpetrated even today. And when the um, when we try to decolonize from it with all the evidence that we have around it, you know, with the satellite imageries and with the with genetics and other linguistic studies that have been conducted. Yet, the Aryan Dravidian trope does not go away from our, um, you know, existence from our existing uh, academia. So that legacy is also a shackle around us because it continues to perpetrate in creating the Aryan Dravidian divide. And it is great that there, there is a big movement towards creating that Tamil Sanskrit Sangam and, you know, building the bridges between, um, between the North and the South India, which I think was a major part of social engineering that the British did at that time. So I think that is an important thing to remember that, you know, I don't think we even owe an explanation as to why that theory should go away. It should go away because it is a racist theory. That is a simple reason why it needs to be relegated to the trash bin. So I think that along with the fact that many of our murtis have come back, you know, from the museums, as long as they stayed in the museums in glass cages, you know, the power of those murtis was tied down. I think with, uh, I think the Modi government having brought them back and, you know, installed them back in, a, in the Indic context, I think that is very liberating to us. And that is why these are layers of onion that keep peeling and it shows that our Indic identity can be brought back and the symbol, symbolism around it cannot be ignored. I want to say this because think about it from the Ram Mandir perspective, right? When the locks of the Ram Mandir, which were locked for more than 30 or 40 years, when they were broken, when the door was open, there was a big change in the energy of the country and how, you know, it became a movement through the Rath Yatras or the revival of the BJP or the, you know, from, from its Jansang days to a new um, new form and uh, for, so political power which the Hindu identity has never had for say you know from from the time when there were Islamic invasions from that time till um, say the 1980s there were shackles around that identity and when the Ram when the when the lock opened. It brought a new renaissance. So that is why I say semiotics and symbols and reclaiming of our um, temples and murtis and swastik and trishul are so important that it has to come back to us in all its positivity and all that negativity has to uh, be removed in whatever way and however we can do it. Um, I think from that, I want to say that this inflicts upon us a lot of mental trauma. You know, this hard genociding, ethnic cleansing, and coming down to, say, the conversion process where the converted feels superior to their family or their tribe or their community, that definitely brings a certain sense of, you know, inferiority. I remember when we study in, like, convent schools, we are the Hindus even today, my um, classmates, they will buy school buses, they will donate to the schools that are being run in tribal areas. And they do that because, uh, you know, they feel close to the school. But that money is being used for various different purposes, right? 
conversions is one big one. So we become sort of rootless and atomized because we never study. Our academics have never taught us, right? What we what we should be learning from the Indic perspective or from um, from the Hindu perspective. So I think that shackle is being broken with the new education policy. And that is why there's a big resurgence in the West against us. You know, there is a big resurgence in terms of academic uh, conferences like the Dismantling Global Hindutva Conference. I think many of you must have, he have heard about it. Dismantling Global Hindutva Conference was held on 9-11, the day when America suffered the largest attack, or uh, terror attack on its soil. And on that very day, there was a conference with 45 plus American universities participating, plus other 15, 20 other universities across the globe participating. And the conference was called Dismantling Global Hindutva, and it had a RSS being, you know, yanked out with a hammer, you know, RSS uh, sort of a puppet, you know, being yanked out with a hammer out of its uh, cog. So that sort of violent imagery was being perpetrated there. So you can imagine what kind of discussions were going on there. I did a sentiment analysis of um, the conference and transcripts of the conference to understand what was being spoken at this conference, why are they worried about Hindutva, how do they define Hindutva, and what is, um, you know, what is their problem with Hindutva or Hindus. And very interesting facts came through during that conference. The first important fact that came through to me in that analysis was that whenever we try to define ourselves, as Hindus, when we take ownership of our own definitions of who we are, um, then that is a big problem and that is called Hindutva. You know, of course, political power in the hands of the Hindus is also called Hindutva. That's a lay perspective. Everyone knows that. But beyond that, when the RSS, Vanavasi Kalyan Ashram, goes to the tribal regions, calls them Vanavasis instead of Adivasis, that is a big problem for these group of people who are the classic break India forces that Raju Malhotra describes in his book, Breaking India. Now, when the Indic identity resurfaces among these Vanavasis, that is a problem. So there was a big statement being made that these Adivasis have started to worship Durga now instead of Mahishasur. Right? They have started to worship Ram now instead of Ravana. You know? So they are now proud of uh, celebrating uh, Holi and Diwali. So that to them is a big problem because that strengthens the Hindu identity. The other important point to note from that conference is that whenever the caste calculus breaks, you know, when the Hindus do not think of themselves in terms of Dalit or Adivasi or, you know, other sectarian um, manners, then that is a breaking of caste calculations for election purposes or other um, resource allocation purposes. And that to them is Hindutva. So that, these are two big definitions that came through. Um, whenever there's a decolonization process going on in India, you know, reclamation of their institutions or rebuilding of a certain Indic ethos, that to them is Hindutva. So obviously, breaking India forces will never want that identity to come through. And Hindutva, attacks on Hindutva directly talk about Brahmanical patriarchy, Brahminism, and pejorative words for Brahmin. So to them, the Brahmin identity is close to the Hindu identity and the Hindutva identity. Attack on a Brahmin, as I saw in my sentiment analysis, is also an attack on Hindus and Hindutva. Now, that semantics are very pervasive, they overlap, and hence the idea that Hindus try to sometimes think that, oh, 
they don't understand this attack because Brahmins were a force to reckon with who were an important aspect of the fight against the, um, the British colonizers or even the Islamic invaders. That fact is clear when you see uh, or read real history. I worked with Dr. Omendra Ratnu on Maharanas and it was clear that the gurus like Goraknath Math, the teachers of, of these um, Maharanas were very, very important to the revival of Hinduism of, or, or at least the Dharmic fight that happened against these forces because of which India is the only country and Hinduism is the only religion and you know Indic identity is the only civilization that does not exist only in museums. It has an existence in real world. So the breaking of caste calculus that is happening in India is very important to understand because that is the reason the BJP seems to be winning according to this BGHC conference and as such the tropes of caste, Dalit and Adivasi are being brought back into the diaspora. So it's very important because the diaspora today what they cannot do in India because of the way that there is a stronger government that is that recolonization is being put upon the diasporic Indian American or Hindu American. And so today we have caste policy coming into America. There's been um, caste discussions in Canada, in UK, in Australia. So why is that happening? And can I just say it's happening, of course, because they want to fight breaking of the caste calculus in India, because of which many of these elections are not being won by them. But um, so these forces definitely have a tie up with the opposition party. This was very clear in the DGHC analysis that I did, right? And we have to understand that the fake narratives that they have perpetrated for years and years on about the swastika or, you know, going back to say the Aryan Dravidian theory or caste as a Hindu concept are all being brought back into the modern American narrative, right? So in the USA, there are three false ways in which caste is being brought in. First of all, there was a fake unscientific survey that was conducted. It was conducted seven years ago. That data is still being used. And Harvard is the center of critical caste theory and such academic developments using this particular data also. If this data is being used across politics, it's being used in university campuses. And if you think about it, fake and scientific data is being used by Ivy League universities and politicians to call Indians and Hindus specifically as racist, as casteist, and um, you know, uh, discriminatory. Secondly, a Cisco caste discrimination case was falsely created. It was completely fabricated. There was definitely prosecutorial abuse. Cassgate.org is a website that documents all of the details on how the state went after two Brahmin boys who really did not do anything to discriminate against their Dalit candidate. In fact, the other candidate who was promoted in place of this Dalit was also a Dalit candidate. So they ignored all those facts. They did not present that case to the judge. And later, the case is dismissed today. These two boys have been exonerated, but that happened only after the defendants, Sundar Iyer and Ramana Kompela, filed a motion for sanctions, which means they directly told the judge that the state is lying. And they said the state should pay penalty. So the state withdrew the case and Today, um, both these pillars, the unscientific survey, the Cisco case, and a false definition of Hinduism, calling it a casteist religion, right, is being perpetrated in the United States to build caste policy, right? Now, this is 
what I always say is that if you can't hold the nose like this, you hold it like this, right? So there is a demand for caste census in India, which, you know, is why is this being done after, say, 1931 census? There has been a ban on caste census in India because our leaders at least realized at that time that caste is not a good idea because it is a colonizer's identity thrust upon us. So caste and Dalit and Adivasi were terms that were put on to us in 1900, in the, in the early 1900s. And because of that, these three terms are being brought back again in the diaspora, creating what I call the recolonization of the Hindu Americans. Right? So these are important things to remember. And today, Brahmin defamation is becoming common in, in social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. You know, people go after, even in the Dismantling Global Hindu Conference, they literally said that people with last names like Ayer, last names like Mukherjee, Trivedi, Sharma, you know, are casteist and Brahminical, and so they should be, uh, you know, treated as criminals. So this reminds you of the Criminal Tribes Act of the 1871 that the British imposed, where they actually said that if you are from this particular tribe, you are a criminal and you can be killed at birth. So this is the sort of um, hate and Hinduphobia and Brahmin hate that we are facing in the US, right? And on social media, and there have been studies done by, for the Jewish um, anti-Semitic tropes and for Hindu tropes in, in, in the US, which show that if there is social media hate, it translates into uh, physical hate on the ground and we are seeing that we are seeing that on a day-to-day -day basis in the United States where people are being slurred in you know in restaurants on streets there have been physical attacks there are some attacks which people are not even reporting on children um, you know sexual attacks that are happening and things like that which are available to us but right now it is you know it, we are fighting it every single day to make sure that the caste trope is not hurled back onto us. Caste, as such, as you know, is a Portuguese term or an Iberian term, and it has been completely taken away from there. You know, nobody talks about it. They had terms like, based on color coding of the people, they had the Peninsular, the Criollos, the Indios, the Mest mestizos, the um, mulattoes, and the negro, right? Caste in itself, today nobody talks about these terms, right? So for example, a mulatto was a, a, a child that was born to a white and a black. He was called a mulatto. So these are now pejorative terms. They are actually banned. Negro, as you know, is a slur. Nobody says a word like nigger or negro because it's called the n-word because nobody wants to speak it. It's it's considered a slur and you can be criminally, uh, you know, uh, charged for using a word like that. So um, caste, I think, caste is an N word. It's a trope for Hindus and it has to be um, treated as such, you know. The fact that they are being using it and abusing us when it is clearly known that caste identity is diluted, caste discrimination is non-existent, according to important and very um, uh, reputed surveys that have been done, like Carnegie Endowment Survey, which shows that caste, um, is, uh, caste discrimination does not really exist in the United States. So the fake surveys like Equality Labs are being used to create these sort of fake uh, discrimination stories when actually there is no single police report in the United States. The Cisco caste case has now go uh, gone and clearly showing that there has been some uh, fabrication there. So um, that sort of brings me to the end of the shackles because the fact that we have to break this caste shackle, you know, um, also is probably dissolving caste consciousness as Pandit Sati Sharma always says to me that that is probably our biggest goal at this time. When there is a churn, when there is manthan, that is the time that we have to make sure that we put in that energy to make sure that caste consciousness is dissolved, that that trope is recognized as a slur for Hindus, and that we make sure that the manthan brings amrit for us.
And I think if we look at it, this is Amrit Kal. This is the time when the world is, you know, turning. It's pivoting to a different direction. There is a change of energy. I think it is evident to anybody who's noticing it. And this century has to be that time when we break all these shackles that I spoke about. And I think many others that most people are here, uh, you know, uh, would probably be able to recognize and make sure that we come out of it stronger and establish a dharmic civilization, a dharmic world, you know, with the, if I go back to the de-weaponization, then bring back the Kshatriya spirit, you know, the indomitable spirit which fought for the right with dharma, you know. There was never the idea that everything is fair in love and war. There was always rules, you know. There was the dharma behind all. There was never any capturing of women or, uh, you know, average people were never troubled. War was fought between people who were on the battlefield. So those kind of lofty ideals, the glorious heritage that we carry is what we need to reclaim and rebuild. And that has to happen starting from academia downwards into the battlefields of real life, you know. And building our own terminologies, our own vocabulary of how we talk, the fact that we still use caste for uh, jati, varna, and kula to define ourselves, I think is, is in itself something we have to separate out, you know, peel out those layers and throw them away. Because jati, I have studied that, you know, the word jati comes in, in Gujarat, for example, the word jati is called nati. And it actually comes from the root word of same as gyan. So if you think about it, knowledge streams were formed into community and called jatis. So even though people keep saying that it was about um, birth-based occupation, actually nati, as it is known in Gujarat, is actually the same na that is used in gnan, and that same word is used in, same letter is used in jati. So that, that is the sort of understanding of, um, of our own identity that we need to get back to, to make sure that we are not falling into the trap of how they define us and make sure we bring back the dharmic energies, the subtler sciences of intuition and subtler sciences of understanding energy. Like that is what um, our, our lifestyle used to be, the sustainable way of life. And also um, the decentralized model, right? The decentralized model where knowledge was also uh, free and decentralized as, as, you know, what made us Vishwa Guru. Um, wealth in itself was decentralized. There was never the oligarchic models which were created during the European Renaissance. I think the Indic Renaissance will bring back a lot more dharmic energy. You know, the four Purusharts that are part of our Indic uh, or Hindu way of thinking, if you think about it, the Western world only functions on Artha and Kama. You know, if you think of the idea of dharma, that really does not play into this sort of world where, you know, it's a rat race or, you know, you th think about all is fair in love and war or those kind of power plays that are particularly part of our culture today, you know, where fratricide is not considered, uh, fratricide is normalized, it's not considered, um, you know, a big deal where, you know, entire communities are being wiped out when there are Shia, the Shia Sunni wars or there are, you know, wars between, um, you know, the, the thousand year wars between Christianity and Islam, this huge, um, you know, huge loss of lives that have happened over these t years and that the dharmic world should basically look into, uh, you know, if we build our own pillars, look into how we can energize dharma and also the concept of moksha, which I think was an integral part of living. You know, whether you are a sculptor or whether you are, uh, you know, working in scholarly fields or 
in the fields as an agriculturist, every single person had was coded into understanding that there was Maya and that there is Moksha. So that understanding, I think, has to become uh, sort of much more mainstream in the world because actually the world is looking at us. It is looking at us for knowledge. When I see the average person, not the political person, but the average person is looking at how, you know, they can bring back that spiritual energy into their lives, bring that spirit, and they're fascinated by Hinduism. So Hindu Dharmic knowledge has to build outreach to the entire world. And I think many of our gurus are doing that. So I think in conclusion, I just want to say that, you know, the shackles of Hinduism need to be broken and the strength that we carry within us, the resilient strength that has allowed us to survive for so long, will come back only when we bring back a Kshatriya spirit, you know, bring back our knowledge systems, those knowledge systems which have been taken over or have been destroyed and have been, you know, they are hidden in plain sight, but we have to go back to them and bring those uh, back, you know, start educational uh, programs in that. And also the idea that the strength that Bharat has or the Indic identity has is also the strength of Devi, you know, the the Shakta traditions or the idea that there is a Devi, a Shakti, you know, resident in every village, in every city, in or as Bharat Ma. And that is carried over to the entire world, you know, as a knowledge system that needs to perpetrate so that there is a balancing of complementary energies, which at this time are definitely lopsided. You know, there is an over-domination of the masculine energy, which is why though we have lip service to climate change and, you know, sustainability, that gratitude towards the energy and that prayerfulness towards the Shakti is missing. So that needs to come back. And I think that is a tradition that needs to go all over the world. And that in itself will break, help us break those shackles that keep the, you know, what is known as the pagan world tied down. And I think Hinduism is that seed at this time, dharma, seed of dharma that can help propagate it to the entire world.